Hello. Hello. It's that time of year again. Coldness. First weekend of December. Woo. You know what that means, don't you? Christmas tree's going up. It's time for Sean's annual bath. <laughs> In it. I don't, <laughs> you don't smell that bad, to be honest, to say it's been a year. Old spice and vinegar, I, I think. <laughs> I'll smell better when he's, had, when he's got the yard broom to mm. me. It is chilly though, isn't it? It is, yes, I'm wrapped up. It has been getting cold. You know what they say, the north wind shall blow and Sean is a mower. Or we, no, the north, when the north wind does blow, we shall have snow. Is it? Yeah. S somewhat like that anyway. Yeah. Uh, Sean, unfortunately, is not quite still fit enough to help us in today's video, are you? <laughs> his, his knees, his, well, it's actually, it's getting... It's a lot better. You can tell it's getting better because he can now forecast the weather with his knee, can't you? I can, yes. Yeah, all those jokes about feeling it in your bone and you actually can now. <laughs> so what's it going to be like then? Uh, sunny. I meant your knee. <laughs> so, so today I'm going to be doing some work up at the apiary. Uh, said it right that time. He did. Uh, but because Sean can't really manually do stuff, he's going back in the house with his hot water bottle. Yeah. Watch, watch his stories, and he's going to do some knitting, aren't you? No. He's going to do. Hey, you were inspired by that diver, weren't you? Mm, Who does absolutely knitting? Absolutely not. What's his name? <laughs> no. Uh, Jack Cousteau, that's Jack it. Jack Cousteau! That's who I'm thinking of. He's a famous <laughs> diver, isn't he? He is, yeah. yeah. He was good in them cartoons as a kid, wasn't he? The most famous diver. Pink Panther. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he was good in that. <laughs> uh, so, so he's going to go in and do that. We might see you again at the end, I don't know. Just might do. Drag you out again. Yeah. You, you do seem a bit chilly, don't you? Eh? I'm warm in this coat and scarf. But I've got to go up to the apiary. Hello and welcome to the edge of the apiary which is up at the far end of our croft. Now it's been very chilly this past few nights down to about minus three, minus four. We've got some snow on the way over the weekend and into next week and so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk to you about what we do to protect the bees from the winter in the highlands because we've had some questions over the last few weeks about it. Uh, the most common one is do they hibernate over winter? Well, not like you imagine some mammals hibernate. They don't kind of go to sleep and then wake up in the spring. But they do stop foraging. They don't come out for a couple of reasons. One, there's not much to forage, to be honest. They're not going to get much nectar and pollen over the winter. And the other reason is it's just too cold. They wouldn't survive it. They need to stay together and keep warm. But they are very efficient at surviving the winters. Winter preparation for the bees began months ago during the early spring. The bees cleared out all the comb where last year's winter stores were being kept and that left thousands of clean cells all ready for the queen to lay new eggs and build the colony back up. The size of the colony doubles over the summer and that means that there's more worker bees and they can collect more pollen to feed the new baby bees and nectar to create honey and they'll store all that honey for the coming winter. During the summer months when the colonies are really busy, there could be anything between 50 and 60,000 bees in each of these hives. But as the days start to get shorter and the nights longer and colder, the bees have to make some decisions in order to survive the winter. And one of the victims are going to be the drones, the male bees. Now, to be honest, the drones don't really pull their weight around the hive. All they do is mate with the queen. They don't actually work that much. And so during the winter, they're gonna be taking up the resources. They're gonna be eating the honey that the workers have stored. But if they're not gonna be doing anything, what's the point? Cause that could put the whole colony at risk if they run out of food. So as the days start getting shorter, the workers start weakening the drones and physically carrying them out, kicking them out of the hive, leaving them out in the cold to die. As the winter starts to bite and it gets colder, the bees cluster together to maintain the heat. And the colder it gets, the tighter the cluster will get. Right in the center, the queen will be there and she'll be lovely and warm, 35 degrees Celsius in the middle, about 95 Fahrenheit. And then over the winter, the cluster will move around the hive, eating the honey that they've stored during the summer. Now hopefully there's enough in there to last them the four or five months before they start coming out foraging again next spring. But over these next few months, there's three things that I really want to keep an eye on to make sure they've got the best chances of surviving the winter. Mm -hmm. 
The first thing I want to think about is insulation. Do I insulate the hives? Now I've talked about this a couple of times on previous vlogs. Where we live in Sutherland, in Highland Scotland, it's actually one of the places that's got the lowest recorded temperature in the UK. A few years ago, minus 27.2 Celsius, which is about minus 17 Fahrenheit. That is pretty chilly, to be honest. It's not been like that while we've lived here, but we're not far from the place that recorded minus 27. But is it worth insulating the hives? Well, it's a good question because you might think if you live further south in England that the winters would be really cold up here and minus 27 is chilly. But they don't get insulated out in the wild. And if I was to insulate the hives, there's a few different ways that I could do it. I could just put some insulation material on top of the crown board, which is just under the roof. Or I could put some filler frames in. Because the colony tightens up into a cluster, I could take some of the outer frames out and put some insulated frames in just to give them some more insulation. I did that last year with a couple of my first hives. Some people put big giant tea cozy type insulation over the whole hive. What I am going to do is I'm going to use some natural insulation and I'm actually going to put that between the crown board and the roof. The heat's going to rise and the first place it's going to go out of is the roof if it's cold. So that's where I'm going to insulate. It's not actually the cold usually that kills the bees. It's the moisture, the condensation that builds up inside the hive. Now, if you don't insulate it properly, if it's too damp, if you don't keep it well ventilated, you're gonna get moisture which will form mold growth and that's what will kill the bees, not necessarily the cold. And that's what I've got in mind. By protecting the top, that's gonna to stop the heat hitting the cold roof and forming condensation. And hopefully, fingers crossed, that's gonna be the right choice for these bees this winter. The second thing that I've really got to keep an eye on is making sure they've got enough food to last them over the winter. Now, the good thing is that we had a bumper crop of honey. The heather just went wild in August and September. All the hives I've got are absolutely packed. They store about 15 to 20 kilos of honey just in that box. It's about 40 pounds of honey. And we don't touch that. We don't harvest that. That's theirs for the winter but they can actually make upwards of 50 kilos of honey in the supers that we add on top. That's well over 100 pounds of honey, and that's the honey that we harvest. Now we take that, but there should be enough in there to last them the whole of the winter. But how can I check how much food they've got as the winter goes on without opening the hive? Because I don't want to take the roof off and let all the cold in the hive. That's not gonna be good for the bees. Well, there's an easy way to do it. It's called hefting. Now, beekeepers have got different methods of doing this. I like to keep it simple. Unstrap the hive, get my fingers under the front, hold the back, and just tilt the hive backwards. Kind of lift it a little bit, and you get to feel the weight. When you start doing all the hives across the apiary, you get a feel of which hives are heavier or lighter than others. And if some of them are getting a bit too light, I need to give them some fondant, which is easy. I just get a big block, it's about 12 kilos, cut it into one kilo blocks, wrap it in cling film, and then put that just above the crown board. And the bees will eat that through the winter if we need to supplement them. Some of them will need it, some of them probably won't. So we've got the insulation sorted, we've got the food and the hefting sorted. What's the third thing that I need to keep an eye on over the winter? Well, it's pests and diseases. If I'm keeping the hives toasty warm with lots of food inside, then that's gonna encourage pests that would also like to be toasty warm and have a little bit of something to eat. The thing that I've got to watch for most here is mice. The mice can be very small and they can get in the entrances to the hives where they can then eat the honey and the honeycomb. They can cause havoc in there. Now luckily there's a really easy way to stop the mice from getting in. I had these mouse guards. It's a strip of metal with holes drilled into it. Now the holes are just big enough for the bees to come in and out but they're too small for the mice to be able to get in. Now I do need to make sure 
that the entrance is kept clear for a couple of reasons. One is ventilation, but the other is the bees do come out during the winter, not very much, only when it's nice, dry and sunny. But they like to come out and go to the toilet because they don't like to go to the toilet in the hive because it makes it messy. The other reason I need to keep it clear is because bees will die in there over the winter. And some of the worker bees have the job of undertaker, which means they have to remove the dead bees from the hive because if there's a disease, they don't want it spreading to other bees. So the undertaker bees need enough space to be able to get the dead bees out of the hive. And what can happen is if it's too small, they can't get them out and the dead bees start to build up and block the entrance and exit to the hive. And that's bad news because then the other bees can't get in and out. So even though I won't be opening up the hives and inspecting them over the winter, I will still be coming up here at least once a week and just checking the entrances to make sure they're clear. If they're not, I can just take the pins out, clear the entrance and put the mouse guard straight back on. The other pest that worries a lot of beekeepers is a mite called the Varroa mite. Can't really get away from this one, but you can control it. Now, I decided to treat all my colonies in the early autumn because my reckoning is that the clearer they are of Varroa going into winter, the better chance they've got of surviving the winter without any remaining Varroa mites causing any problems. So what I do is we use these strips, uh, these break into two and we put uh, one, well we put two in each brood box. We leave them there for about six, seven weeks and then take them out. And the bees crawl over the strips, there's a, a, a compound in the strips that kills the Varroa mite. Can't expect to get every single one of them, I don't think we'll ever really wipe them out. But we can control them and that gives the bees a better chance of surviving the winter. And finally, I've put all the hives on these stands. It raises them about 10 inches off the pallet which is already about four or five inches off the ground. And there's a little bit of waterproof membrane between the stand and the hive to stop any water soaking up the wooden stand legs and then into the hive, making it moist in there, which is what we don't want. The stand raises them up. So if it snows and starts drifting, it's gonna keep the entrance clear. It's also strapped down. As you can see, the black strap around it and that stops any deer, which there are a lot of. They come down from the hills in the winter, down to lower ground here. And they can rub the bums against the hive, knock it over. It also stops badgers and rabbits and pine martins trying to get in there to the honey. So it's just another level of protection. And hopefully, all that put together will keep them nice, safe, dry, warm and well fed until we see them again in the spring next year. I still feel like a total newbie to beekeeping. I'll be coming into my third year next spring. And I sometimes feel a little bit fake. What's it called, imposter syndrome? where I've learned so much, I really have learnt a lot, and I still feel that like I've probably learned about 1% of things that I need to know. And I talk to experienced beekeepers all the time, and I know beekeepers that have been doing it for decades, and, and they say the same thing. I have got really attached to them. And it's strange because I've got 21 hives spread over quite a few miles now. But I know every single hive. I know the personality of the colony in every hive. I know their story. I know their strengths and weaknesses. I know what annoys them. I know how calm some of them are. And it's, I think it's helping me. That sounds selfish, but that was the whole reason I did this, because of my overthinking and my mental health. And this is such a distraction for me. So it does do me good. Hopefully it does the bees good and it does the environment good. And I hope it continues into next year. I hope I can get all 21 colonies through this winter. That might be a big ask. And I think a lot of that depends on, well, how bad the winter's going to be. How well I look after them, which I think I'm doing everything that I can. 
and I think we've just got to wait. I'm gonna be up here every few days, just walking around, just checking the entrances are clear, doing the heft test every couple of weeks or so to make sure they've got enough food. I've got fondant on standby already blocked up. I might not need it, I hope I don't, but if I do, it's there waiting. So they're not gonna go without food. The thing is, I do love the snow. So I can't say that I hope it's a mild winter because I'd like to see some snow and it's not gonna hurt them. Obviously the snow will insulate the hives anyway a little bit, as long as it's not too deep that it comes over. But then if it does, I'll be here clearing it away. But it's just waiting now, isn't it? Fingers crossed, doing my best for them. And hopefully by next spring, March, April time, the first warm sunny days, I'm gonna see them coming out again and starting to collect the nectar and the pollen from the spring flowers. I can't wait for that. Oh, I'm back. Oh, it's back. I've got my bee suit off. I've put my bee suit in the wash now for the winter. To get for all, the win all winter? To get all the hate sting smell out of it, ready for next year, then they don't attack me. Did you get much knitting done then? None. He's been knitting Christmas presents, haven't you? <laughs> Mittens for the gormless. <laughs> It ought to be a charity, that, didn't it? <laughs> Can't say that. Mittens for the gormless. It's got to be better than that sweater you knitted for me last year. <laughs> it's, it was one of them sweaters where it had one of them collars that looks like a foreskin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't like them. Don't get me, don't make me one of them. <laughs> don't believe him, I don't knit. Don't make me one of them. I've actually got, we've, we've actually got an Amazon wish list, haven't we? If you want to treat the yeah. dogs or, or Sherlock or the chickens or the bees or us to a little bit of summer, uh, I think there's a link down in the video description. Somewhere. Uh, but yeah, get me some offer there. There's some chocolate in there. Yeah, yeah. He won't listen. I'll end up with one of them foreskin jumpers again, like I always do. And, and a pair of gormless mittens, won't yes, I? Yes, you will, I yes. Will. Uh, that is it for this time. Uh, we're putting his tree up this weekend. We are, we? yes. We might show you that a little bit next We've, week. Yeah, yeah, we might. Do uh, but that's it for this week. Hope you've enjoyed the vlog. If you're not already, please subscribe to the channel. Yes. Uh, give the video a thumbs up. And if you hit the wibbly wobbly notification bell, YouTube will tell you every time we release a new video. Every Friday at four o'clock. Well, ish, ish. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to help support the channel, uh, you can join us on Patreon, get some exclusive content and some little bits and pieces that other people don't get. More rubbish. Uh, there might be a link up above Sean's head. If it's not there, because it depends what device you're watching on, it'll be down in video description. Are we done? I think so. We'll see you next week. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. <laughs>